I'm going to show you how to solve using technology. Remember what we do in solving. I mean, when we have an equation we're trying to solve, like e to the x equals cos x, the idea is to set the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side. Now, that sounds really trite and stupid, but I'll show you we can solve by graphing. So we can actually do a graph of the left-hand side, do that as its own equation. We can do the graph of the right-hand side as its own equation. The idea then is just to find the intersection. That's because what it means to be equal means same as, right? So that's where the two graphs meet. So we can do this in a number of ways. We can do this with a TI Inspire, for example, if you happen to have that one. This is a way to do it. So you open up a new graph, do the first graph, that's the left-hand side, do the f2 of x, that'll be the right-hand side. Then to solve it, go to Menu, Analyze, and Intersection, and you'll find it. If you're using a TI-84, it's quite similar, except at the very top, you just press the Y equals buttons, and you just say Y equals this one, you make the second one equal to that, and to solve, you go to Calculate, and then Intersection. So let me show you what I mean with this example here. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll do a quick sketch of it, actually. This will maybe help. And we'll see what to do here. So the, the idea is actually quite simple. We'll see how it goes. So we've got an x here and a y. Well, I've got to do e to the x equals cos x. So let me do a graph here. I'll open up my trusty graph. So give me a new one. Here we go. And I want to do e to the x as my first equation. So I'm going to go e to the x and say go. All right, that's my graph of e to the x. And then I have a graph of cos x. So let me do that one. So trig cos and do x here. Um, I want to make sure I'm in, oops, I want to make sure I'm in radians. I don't think it uh, did it here. Let me just do it again here. So I wanted cosine of x. There we go. All right, it looks like this. Now we have a, a domain here they've given us, so minus pi to pi, so let me do that. So I can go to menu and I can say, give me a window. Now you can do zoom trig, it turns out, that's a good one. Or you can just do uh, zoom settings and just set it like this. I can say minus, and I can actually put in the value of pi here. So minus pi, tab, and then press pi. I want there, and maybe I'll uh, just do everything else auto and see what happens. There we go, it looks kind of like this. So the graph of e to the x goes up, the graph of cosine goes like this. So let me attempt to do some sort of diagram like this. So do it maybe with the same colors we had there. So the e to the x one went kind of like this. That was e to the x. Uh, maybe my to the power didn't look like that, so I'll change it like this. There we go. And my graph of uh, cosine went something like, uh, how did it go here? How high was it? Let's see here. Well, I mean, it starts off at uh, 1, uh, 0, 1. It always does. It's a cosine graph. And it goes down like this. So it's going to meet right here and there. So it's going to go something like, whoops, like this. And it's going to do something like uh, this. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's something like this. So the key thing is to see where it is that those two things meet. So they meet here and here. Those are the two places where they intersect, which means that's where they meet. So that's, that's the intersection here. So I'm going to ask my calculator for that. So I just go to Menu in this case and say Analyze and say Give me the intersection. And it says Lower Bound. Maybe I'll do the lower one here first. I'll do that one. There it goes. So it's minus 1.29. So I'll make sure I say that. So this one here is minus 1.29. The other one here I think is at zero, but let's just double check just to be sure. So I go to menu and do analyze and give me the intersection. Go from here to here. Sure enough, it's at x equals zero. Now, I don't care about the y value. I cared about the x's when I'm solving this. So I have my two solutions and I have x equals roughly, because an approximate to three significant figures, and I have x equals zero. Those are my two solutions, and I'm done. See, I've solved this in this uh, domain at least. Right? There might be other solutions. In fact, there's going to be lots more. If I kept going, keep in mind what uh, this graph does. This graph actually keeps going like this, like that. So it's going to cross a bunch more times. So it's important to keep in mind what kind of domain restrictions you're given. That's why I like this in here. <laughs> F. My <laughs> uh, all right, so if we want to solve for calculator directly, so without graphing, 
We can also use some tools that we have here. So we have the TI Inspire, we have uh, you know menu, you go to algebra and do numerical solve. So you can put in the equation. Um, you can also use the TI-84. You could just use the uh, app called Poly Simultaneous Equations 2. But there's a problem with this. NSolve is only going to give you one solution. So you're going to miss other ones unless you're really careful. That's why I always recommend that you graph. You should graph instead of using this method here. Okay, so I'm just going to show you. But I think you should graph so you can see the solutions. Let's see why NSolve in this case is going to fail us. I'm going to use this. I'm going to say uh, it's going to be NSolve. I'm going to make sure it looks like uh, e to the x equals cos x comma solve for x please that's what i'm going to ask it to do here so let me just show you how i could have done the same question i could solve it i'll do a calculator here I press menu i go to algebra and say numerical solve so there we go i'm going to put an e to the x equals whoops there we go equals cosine of x and don't forget you have to do comma X, you have to tell it to solve for x. Now it gives me x equals 0, which isn't wrong, it's correct. So I mean I have 0. Therefore I would think that x equals 0 only. So do you notice how there's a problem? There was another solution in this range here. Do you notice? So this here is the key part here. It didn't tell me. So it didn't tell me uh, the solution that was, uh, what was that again? It was uh, 1.29, wasn't it? Isn't that it? Yeah. Oh, minus 1.29. So it didn't tell me the uh, minus 1.29 solution. So we're missing one. So that's just why this method right here is not as good. You should, I think you should graph. By the way, I like this one right here. Well, yes, but actually, no, look, you have 3 plus x equals 1 plus 8. Divide by plus. That you can't do, but let's just pretend you divide it by plus. That gives you uh, 3x, so they say. Then you divide those both by 3, and you end up with just x equals 6. And you're like, well, technically, yes, because 3 plus 6 does equal 9. That's why I like it. Well, yes, but actually, no. So let's do a, a real example here. We have radioactive carbon dating. Get it? Carbon dating. Is it? No, oh, no, dating. We have radioactive carbon dating. We do this in real life, um, and we use, well, we call it C14. And physically, this is carbon-14. It's a radioactive isotope of carbon-12, the normal carbon. So the following equations are used. We're going to use this equation right here, this thing that goes A equals A0 e to the minus lambda t. Now, we just have a lot of um, variables. I'm just trying to show you. This is a real physics example. We can do this for physics. So A is the activity now, and it's measured in a unit called becquerels. So that's BQ. It's also known as a decay per second, but same, same. We have A0, the initial activity. That's how many decays per second there were initially at the start. We have this thing called lambda, which is a decay constant. It'll have units of 1 over time, so in this case it'll be years to the minus 1. T is the age in years. And we also have something relating to a half-life. So in physics, I actually show how to derive this equation. It turns out you get it by just setting A equals half of A0. It turns out solve for T, and you end up with this. It's kind of cool. So you end up with lambda equals ln2 over t1 half, where t1 half is the half-life. That tells you how long does it take for you to end up with half the original uh, atoms you had. So all that sounds really complicated, but now we have this. this is a real-life example, actually. This is really cool. So we have a sample from the Dead Sea Scrolls and has the following. So it has carbon-14 activity is 10.8 becquerels. Initial activity was 13.6. That's like when it was made. Uh, now it's got this activity. And the half-life of carbon-14 is 5730 years. What's the age of the Dead Sea Scrolls sample? I think it's a kind of a cool example. So let's start by finding the things we're going to need. Hmm. To do the age, we're going to need to go no t here. So let's just put in the different numbers. We have a, the activity now. That's actually this one right here. This is a zero. This one here is t one half. Okay, so we have those. So let's put those numbers in then. So we have, let's see, a, so we have 10.8. That equals a zero, which is 13.6, times e, to the power of minus lambda, which you don't quite know yet, times uh, t. So do you notice that we're just going to try to plug in or try to solve for this lambda here. We're going to try to figure out what that is. Now that lambda, let's see now, lambda is going to be equal to uh, ln2 
over the half-life, which is 5730. Okay, so I could then state that 10.8 equals 13.6 e to the minus ln2 over 5730, all that times t. Phew. So let me see if I can solve this with my calculator. Maybe I'll do it by graphing, see how that goes. So I'll do a graph, it's gonna be a big mess, but we'll see how it looks. So we'll have 10.8. Um, I'll do that graph. All right, well, give me a, a window. Let me fit this just so I can see this graph. This is a graph of 10.8. There it is, all right, great. Now what I wanna do is try to do a graph of this whole mess right here. So 13.6 times e to the power of, let's see now, negative. I'll do this one right here. I'll say natural log of 2, all that over 5, 7, 3, 0. I'll do all that times x. See how that looks. That's this graph right here. Now we have to try to take a look and see like when will these two actually meet? Right, these two are here, when are they actually gonna meet? Um, I can just zoom out basically. So I can just take this one because they don't seem to be meeting, right? But what if I zoom way out? So I can zoom way out here. In fact, I can zoom way out and way out and way out. Do you notice and they're sort of getting closer here? Kind of. Well, they're getting closer at least as I move this right here way over. Do you notice they're sort of getting closer here and closer and closer and closer and closer? So maybe what I'm going to do is uh, make my x's go really, really far here. So just so you can see, I'm just trying to look at these and try to have an idea for where my settings should be. Maybe I'll make my window go from uh, 1,000 to like, I don't know, like uh, 5,000 maybe. And see if I can catch it there. See how that looks. Look, they've crossed. There is a place where they actually cross. So if there is a case where they cross, see the red one here is above the blue one, and now the red one's below the blue one, so they crossed somewhere. So I can do menu, I can do analyze, and I can ask for the intersection. I'll do it somewhere between here and here. Do you notice that it gives me 1.91 times 10 to the 3? So I could say, ah, well that means t equals 1,910, roughly, years. That'll be the age of this sample. That's kind of a cool way to do it, right? So I just graphed. I just graphed the left-hand side, and I graphed the right-hand side in order to get it. That's one way of actually solving it.